Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVM LP, Asheville, 103.7, and streaming online, WPVMFM.org. The voice of Asheville heard all over the world, and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com, for more on Walter's music. Devine Dial, thank you for managing WPVM-FM in Asheville. And Robin Collier, thank you for managing KCEI-FM in Taos, New Mexico. I do appreciate both stations. Again, thanks ever so much. If you would like to reach me, Nave at jamesnave.com. You can always reach me there. I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you'd like to improve your writing chops, imaginativestorm.com is a great place to look. Also, I'd like to remind you, if you are in Taos on October the 7th, that's a Monday evening, Allegra Houston and I are hosting the Imaginative Storm pop-up community gathering at Mary's Place, Taos Lifestyle. It's south of town on Paseo del Pueblo, sir, 6 to 8 p.m. It's, it's an open house. It's free. It's going to be a little bit of a party. You're invited if you're in town. We'd love to have you stop by and enjoy what we're offering. We're going to do a presentation. Gee whiz, there's a stage there, so why not? Anyway, hope you can make it if you are in town. Today, my guest is Cynthia Schumarsher. Her public relations agent reached out to me and said, would you like to interview a poet you don't know? And I said, absolutely, I certainly would. So that's what we're going to do now. So let's turn our attention to my interview with Cynthia Shoemaker. Cynthia, welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here, too. I was reading over a bit of your bio, and it reveals that you've been in education for many, many years. So I was curious, what would be a good question to ask a poet who's deeply committed to education? And I thought I had the right question. And here it is. Can you tell me? what your definition of education is and why it's so important to continue it after you graduate from school? Well, that's quite a question. Education, I guess it has many, many meanings to most people, but for most people who are just going through the process, it's learning something you don't know already. It's learning new things being introduced to new ideas, possibly new experiences. And as it happens, it happens because you want to do it. You, it has to come from you. And uh, it, nobody can educate you technically in a way that's desirable unless you really agree to it. So let's say you have bad experiences. You put those out of your mind. You don't let them bother you. You get it, have a new experience and you get very excited and you become interested in learning new more things than you know already. That's as close as I can come to, to well, a definition. I'm, I also am curious in a lot of conversations I talk to people and some people will say, I'm very well educated. And other people will say, I'm not educated at all. I, my education was very poor. They so often speak of it in the past tense. Isn't yes. it more current? Are we educating ourselves or can't we consciously educate ourselves every moment that we're awake? I think that's really what you do. Your life is an education. It's a path to learning and everything you experience is part of your learning experience. You may say that's not formal education, but I'm not sure that that matters because I remember reading one time that um, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you put together all the time that I was in a school classroom my entire life, it was about one year. So how did he get educated? Well, he had a mother who did not die until he was nine years old. She educated him by bringing him experiences to learn about. And then he read. He read consistently and educated himself, which, of course, as I say, goes back to the idea you cannot really educate anybody but yourself you can try to help other people but you really are doing it for yourself it's an experience that's quite true and i think because we place such a value on 
a formal education, given it such such we've elevated it so much, that elevation tends to discourage people who maybe haven't had the opportunity to go through those doors. Other people had the opportunity to go through and thus they feel a little diminished because of their lack of education. And then they just give up and don't bother. That may be true. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it probably is a way that people think or add an attitude they could get by saying, oh, well, I'm exp- I'm educated. I'm, I know more than this person. But then that's really a matter of personality. And uh, it's not really necessarily anything that's true. It's just the way they think. Quite true. And I think people learn what they feel moved to learn. But when the fire is in the belly to know something, it's fairly easy to educate yourself around it. Sadly, some people go down a path that doesn't allow them to have that and they have to confine themselves to something that basically they're not interested in. And then they finally just quit the journey and step off the path and set up shop wherever they are. And that's that. So for you, A poet. I noticed you said you've been doing it a long time, writing poetry since you were young. How did that all start and what kind of education did you have? Were you encouraged by your family, your community to go into education, to go to school, to get the formal education? I know you've been a teacher for years and you retired as a teacher. The formal education, you moved into it. Was that easy for you? Did you face challenges? And how did poetry inform the way you moved through your life and your education and your work? I can remember when I was in high school. I came from a not not from a well-to-do family. I was the oldest child in the family. My father, who was a very, very much of a reading person, had never been to college, but he was very interested in everything. And I guess he just led me to believe that learning was was something interesting to do. And I can recall in high school, as as happens with many people, a teacher who did something once in a classroom that I apparently did it correctly or more correctly, I should say, than somebody else or maybe better than someone else from her point of view. And she complimented me and said, oh, you have a flair for writing. Now, that's much, not much of anybody to say. I mean, you, you just hear them say, you think, what are they talking about? But from that moment on, I can recall, because it was a poetry type of experience, that I started reading poetry. Now, all you have to read in high school, usually back in those days, was a survey, you know, like a survey of American literature in the 11th grade or a survey of British literature in the 12th grade. And you don't go into great depth, but I can remember very easily, reading Emily Dickinson, whose writing was in the text that I had. And I thought, how did she do this? How did she rhyme these things? What kind of stanzas did she use? What kind of techniques did she use? And so I self-taught myself. I One of the persons that I consider one of the best poets who was never published ahead of time, because she could say a great deal in a very few words, very well-chosen words, And that idea is something I thought, well, I experiment with that. And that's where I got started. And from that point on, because I was a person who read very widely, I read other people's poetry. So I think what happened was it was a purely natural impulse coming from somebody who had said something nice to me. As often happens when you have one teacher, or maybe many teachers, who show an attention to a certain person by saying something to them that makes them feel like they're kind of special. Maybe they didn't know they were special. And I think that's probably why I wound up in teaching eventually, even though that was not my intent. What was your intent? I can remember in high school, they give you some kind of a test on all the things you're interested in, and this is to help you make a decision if you're going to college. And I can remember that the person who gave me the test told me later, she said, Cynthia, you can't do all these things. I said, what are you talking about? Well, you're interested in everything. You're interested in science. You're interested in music. You're interested in this. You're interested. And she, I said, well, I'm not going to do all those things. Yes, but you're supposed to pick out something that you really like the most. I said, I like everything. I like learning. I like learning new things and trying new ideas. 
So I guess I'll just go to college and find out what I want to what to be. And I recall going to college and what did I wind up doing? Taking English as a major because I love to read. By the time I had finished four years of college, I still wasn't sure. That's how undecided I was. And so I got a master's degree in English. And then quite by accident, I went out and looked for a teaching job just to tide me over until I made up my mind. And then I was hooked. Back in those days, they didn't really have very good preparation programs for teachers. It was mostly what I call philosophical things. But when you get into a classroom and they say to you, can you teach this? And you're looking at all these people and you're thinking, well, I'm the oldest of five children. I think I could probably teach anybody anything. Well, if you like what you're teaching, you make it fun for everybody who wants to learn it. And after a while, you discover everybody's interested in what you're doing. And you think, oh, it's so great to get other people to learn things. How exciting that is. And that's really how you get hooked as a teacher. You take joy in other children, other people, learning something for the first time and discover something that they're very excited about. And then I think that's that stays with you most of your life if you're a good teacher. I'm thinking now back to Emily Dickinson and you discovering Emily Dickinson in the 11th grade, 10th grade, high school. Uh, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd banish us. Hey. You know. And the other one is because I could not stop for death. He kindly stopped for me. The carriage held, but just ourselves and immortality. So those two really short Emily Dickinson poems. Yeah. You know, they're rhymy and they have all kinds yes. of curious. So in the 11th grade, you encounter those two and you understand them slightly. As we age, I'm nobody. Who are you? Becomes the existential question for the life. And because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me becomes the other reality that's encroaching upon us all. And so I just right. always love the, you know, the Emily Dickinson work because of that. And she touches everybody with, I heard a fly buzz when I die. And I can't think of the others right now, but those are three that come to mind that influenced me a Can bit. you think of the one about the bee? The pedigree of honey does not concern the bee. A clover any time to him is aristocracy. Fantastic idea. And, and it is true because the bee maintains the entire balance of nature and the clover is so beautiful. And when you think of aristocracy, removing yourself from the judgments of the elite and think of the democratic aristocracy of the natural world, the beauty that's in the natural world. Right. And there's an aristocracy there. And the beauty of the aristocracy in the natural world, of course, the bee, the clover, and our ability to appreciate it. We belong there as well, as right. the, along with the bee and the clover. Beautiful stuff. What are some of the other pieces that influenced you when you were younger? And people often ask me, well, do you have a favorite poem? And I go, no, I really don't have a favorite one. But I do have poems that have informed the way I think. So question for you, poems that inform the way you think, aside from Emily Dickinson. Well, in high school, I was mostly influenced by her, even though, of course, in the 12th grade, you study British literature. And again, it's like a survey course. But I can remember learning, learning things like personification and things that, you know, that was a technique. But when I went to college, and I majored in, in basically a lot of literature. Uh, what happened was that I got so fascinated with other writers that I began to realize how valuable it was to know to know how to use language, to know how to say things. Mm -hmm. And of course, it isn't always poetry that you deal with. But as I got interested, and, and as I took more and more in-depth things, because I wasn't interested in getting a, how to do anything, I just wanted to learn things. Uh, I can remember at the point at which I learned enough about Shakespeare to understand what I was reading. 
it was like a foreign language just suddenly opened up. And I can recall having such an incredible love for the things in Shakespeare, particularly in the plays. And when I went to teach ninth grade, the very first year I ever taught, when I had no experience in taking courses in, in teaching, but I just had, knew a lot of information, they said, can you teach ninth grade Hamlet? I thought, Hamlet in ninth grade? That's kind of gutty. <laughs> but of course... I thought, these are just kids. They love the story. You tell them the story, and they you don't tell them the end of the story. You just tell them about the story, and they're all dying to, 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 to study this strange thing. And then you find out kids can get up, and they can learn how to say the words, and they can learn how to act out things. Pretty soon, you understand, now they're, they're excited. They love this, just like I do. So maybe I should continue doing this. And I think that's where my love of, of, of literature in general is like you. You have this memory of all these poems you read, and now you remember them. I can remember things from Shakespeare when somebody says, oh, when it rains, it pours. When the king says, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. So after a while, everybody, everybody's language is floating around in your head. And so that's why you keep writing, always to do, to do a little bit better than you knew before with other ideas, but you also don't want to be unoriginal in the way you write. You want to be different. Well, is it I guess that's the combination of everything that happens. And I've I hear that a lot. I, I I don't want I want to be original. I want to be different. And my response to that is how can you miss being different if you work and practice the craft? Eventually you will emerge you you're, there are no there are no original ideas. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Everybody's had somewhere along the line, somebody's had that idea. But the way you say it, the way you want to say it, is what makes the standard. And when you say to your, I want to say this. I have something important. I'm thinking. Now, how do I express that? And what's that's when you start writing poetry because you say to yourself, I don't have time to write a novel. I don't have time to write a short story. If I could think of how to say this idea, and of course, the minute you start writing any ideas down, you realize you haven't got the right words at all. You may you may make 16 drafts of the same poem before you come up with what you really wanted to say. And then you think, well, that's the best I can do. But I bet nobody else has done this much the idea as I have because I've used words that are just for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. somebody else's words and that's how you how you make a standard for yourself and when you get that poem written you think this is the way it needs to be and when you put it down on a piece of paper and you type it don't you change a single word don't you change the way that the lines look on the paper you become fanatic about that and I guess that's why I got into doing a lot of my later when I did actually put my poetry in writing form, in printed form, many, many years later, after I'd saved all of it, I did it then because I thought, well, now I'm a fanatic. I don't want anybody to change anything. Mm -hmm. You don't want anybody to prove your poetry because if they do, they may change something. <laughs> you don't want them to change anything. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just put it that way. You, you develop a set of standards, and after a while you say, okay, the idea is not, not new. But boy, I did say it differently. I did it like Emily Dickinson would do it. I did it in a way nobody think I thought it was possibly right there. Right. So that's the way you do it. And that's why I always wrote varieties of poetry. I never wrote any one kind of poetry. I always would try trying new ways to express an idea or to think, this isn't supposed to rhyme. I was not supposed to make this poem rhyme. So I didn't make it rhyme. Or it did rhyme and I knew it was supposed to rhyme. But you just automatically get away when you spend a lifetime doing it. Right, right. Well, I always think of this. I always think of, well, today it's today it is as good as it's going to be. Now, tomorrow's another day. We'll see what happens. And so I'm always right. in that mindset. Right. Of, I'm wide open. OK, fine. I love what I wrote. It's solid right now. But, you know, by midnight, I may change my mind on on this idea of poetry and writing. I know that you have reached out to me because you have a new book and you have written quite a number of books. So I would like it if you would take a little bit of time to give us a brief overview of the new book that you're offering, as well as read of two or three poems from the book so we can get a sense of your work. 
Any chance that could happen? Okay. Of course I can do that. Uh, I'll mention, first of all, that I wrote different volumes of poetry. When I began to actually self-publish them, I had already retired from teaching. Now I had time to get them in some printed form. I thought, I'm not a famous writer. I'm not going to be doing this as a job. This is something I just want to save all this writing. I don't want to throw it away. Now, Soul Flowers is my seventh collection. I have my first collection that has some of my high school and college poetry, along with things that I wrote much later. So every book I have, I may have a poem or two from some previous time, and then I may have some that I've written very, very recently. Soul Flowers is my latest collection, and I called it Soul Flowers because I finally decided that when you write poetry, it comes from so deep inside you and you spend so long trying to polish it the way you want it. It has to come from your soul. And in a sense, I'm writing for ordinary people who may have had ideas just like mine, but never wrote them down. So being a teacher, I was really promoting the idea that maybe you'd like to write poetry sometime. I wasn't going to support it for myself. But Soul Flowers has a variety of poems, and it has, it has some that rhymes, some that do not rhyme. And there again is how you make up your own idea. But I'll just read a very short one called Business Advice. Now, where, I don't know where the ideas come from, but everybody has needs business advice. So this is a short poem. If you should meet adversity, be bold and shake his hand. His unexpected presence may not be what you have planned, but since his acumen proceeds from confiscating lies, by careful outmaneuvering, the best in you survives. I had a businessman read that to me once. I said, you like that poem? They said, yes, exactly right. <laughs> it's the way I feel because I'm a businessman. And I think that that's, that's a short one, of course. But Soul Flowers, as I said, is the name of the book because that's basically what I was trying to design it to be. They're like flowers of the soul. There are things that maybe you wrote and they came from deep inside you and they could have been humorous or they could have been sad. They could have been very serious. But you want them to survive because they're important, but, but they don't they don't change. They immortalize. And if you write a poem about somebody who died and you don't use their words, their, their name in it, but you just write about them. You invariably will have somebody say, when I read this one, it reminded me of my brother, or it reminded me of my best friend. And I think, but I didn't write it about those people. It's just you brought that experience to the poem. So the more experiences I give you to think about, the more you're going to bring your own experiences to that poetry. I think it was a short one that I read as an example. Uh, I, had, I had another one that I, what you might read. I don't want to read any too long. Of course, well, go but, ahead. Read, read um, a few. Read. I mean, we're here. A lot of a lot of my guests okay. are poets, and, yeah. and and it's poetry, so okay. we can talk about it all day long. Or by golly, you could just read it. So get busy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, this is one I wrote. Someone in my family had died in a very questionable way, and I thought, how do you write a poem? about something you don't really understand what happened to that person. But because there were people in my family that were very much in grief, I need to write something that will endure, that won't make them feel terrible. So I wrote a poem called Memorial Contemplation. We have no need of accolades. We have no need of fame. A life of sharing love and joy should be what we sustain. Our love of God above all else, our love of fellow man, should be the things we honor most throughout our earthly span. A time may come when we may learn there was a better way to overcome life's challenges and gain a brighter day. We may not always choose what is good. We may not always understand, but wisdom comes with trying to do the best we can. And they told me afterward, they said, I love that poem because I feel good about this person instead of feeling bad or sad. So I think that's why you write poetry, because you're really writing for other people and you're trying to find something in the human experience that you like. And um, 
I'm just trying to think of one other one that might be appropriate to use, but um, I remember, I'll use an example without reading this picture. When I had a man tell me once, I read this poem and it sounded just like me. He was a pharmacist and he went to football games. He, went, he had gone to Auburn University and he was a big football person. And uh, he was a pharmacist who kind of filled prescriptions for everybody in the city and so forth. And he was telling me all about his experience. And he said, I really like that poem and I don't even read poetry. I said, well, it's about you. What? What do you mean it's about me? I said, I wrote it about you because you were retiring. And I wanted to write something the way you write something about people when they go to a retirement party, but I wasn't going to put your name in there. Well, how did you how did you do that? I said, well, I know you're right. I know what things you like. So if you like the poem, then you like poetry. You don't have to say, I don't read any. I said, obviously, you like it. And he said, well... <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever read any poems, but I like your poetry. I said, that's great. I'm glad that you did. So that's an example of a short, of a fairly short one. That, but let me read one that, that maybe you can tell me if you like this one. This is called um, Community Project. In a small village on the front porch of a house, an old blind woman sat under the boughs of a tall fir tree. Christmas is coming, she called to anyone passing by. Come decorate for me. Bring strings of multicolored bulbs that sparkled in the night. Bring various objects to hang as ornaments upon the branches of my tree. Lavender gold and baubles would be very nice. Others blue and silver, acorn twigs and holly berries, gold tassels, peacock feathers, silver tinkling bell. I don't need to be precise. Something that you cherish, let that be your choice. When you come to hang those things upon my lovely tree, say a special blessing prayer for each you hang to show you care for people you will never know, for those who can't be here. And when the task was finished and the old blind woman smiled and the tree ablaze with color was visible for miles against the winter sky at night, and folks who came to see it, the ones who helped and others passing by, felt joy was all around. Hardly anyone noticed that the angel at the top of the tree was wearing dark glasses. That was community project. Very, very nice. I don't know that that ever happened to any blind lady. We had a fir tree by her front door, but I thought, well, that's the way you make people feel good. This was a blind lady. She couldn't decorate her own tree. She had nothing but an outdoor tree, but here was the whole community coming to help her out. And when Abba was decorated, they were able to see it. I don't know how they hooked up all the electricity to it, but it worked. And obviously, you went by and you thought, I helped put that tree up. I helped put those branches, something pretty, pretty on the branches. And this lady is really an angel because she gave me a chance to do something really great. Somebody put the dark glasses on the angel. Well, it also speaks to what we have to do in our communities to make something work. We are always erecting trees right. like that metaphorically, and we have to hang the ornaments on it. The ornament would be my children, my family, my event, everything that's gone on in, in my life, your life, our lives. And right. communities that are the healthiest are the ones who elevate everyone, including the lady on the porch who's not able to see. She becomes the angel, the guiding right. light, the vision, right. even without the eyes. Now, that's really terrific. I, I, mean, I was thinking of William Stafford and Edgar Lee Masters when you were saying that poem, um, kind of touching in that same sensibility of, of just or, ordinary humanity being very beautiful because it's in the ordinary, not because it's some outrageous, extraordinary thing. The heroic, famous people who go off to save the world you know, maybe they do something. I'm sure they do. But the people who walk down the street and say good morning are also lifting things up in a way that have equal merit, I think. I think we do not always realize, unless you are a teacher and you've worked with many, many different students, you don't realize that everyone's life is remarkable. But you don't see it as remarkable. 
you may feel your own life is not remarkable. But when you see young people, and they come to you, say, they're 10 years old, and maybe you teach high school later, and you're now teaching children or students who are 14, 15, 16 years old, and you go back from, say, elementary school to high school, not the same as students, of course, but you're thinking to yourself, now, these are just children who grew up. These are children who got older. I have the same obligation to these students in high school to give them an enjoyable experience in my classroom. Because whatever they've had before, they go through five or six classes a day, and all that happens is people talk to them every period. They don't get to really do anything or to talk about the things. They don't get to try anything different. Well, when you're an English teacher, you can try just about anything mm -hmm. because you can take literature and you can do things with literature. You can't do it with everything. But I used to tell the history teachers, the people who taught social studies, I say, make the social studies come alive. These are people. We're all living historical periods. And someday we'll be old and we'll remember the things that other people have forgotten or maybe knew, never knew. But I said, you need to teach history as if it's something that comes alive because we learn from the lessons of history if we're smart enough to remember them. Correct. Or we see the similarities in things that happened many, many cycles ago. And of course, I'm, I'm a very old lady, so I remember the Second World War. But people that I talk to today say, I don't know anything about the Second World War except I saw it in a movie once. I said, well, you were born in 1990. You don't know a lot of things. That's why you have to talk to old people. You have to remember the things in your own life because eventually you'll be old too and you'll wonder why nobody's talking to you. And time goes by fast. It, it really, really does. And our time has gone by yes. rather quickly as well. Before we say goodbye, I want to just thank you for all the insight that you've offered. And I, I, I have a couple of more questions. You said you, you grew up, you were alive during World War II. Uh, how old were you during the World War II experience? Well, let me tell you how old I am now. I am 95 right now. And I will be 96 in a few more months. So I was born in 1928. And we know what happened in 1929. We do, so, don't we? <laughs> so I have a lot of memories. Yes, we do. And of course, when you've had that many experiences, at the time you look back and you think, oh, this happened to me then, this happened to me then. What was happening to the rest of the world? Probably something entirely different, but that's mm -hmm. what I remember. So, right. so I think, you were, I think uh, the perspective of age is very important. Indeed it is. And you were you were a young woman when World War II was going on, so you probably have vivid memories of all of that experience. I was probably 17, 15, mm -hmm. 17 years that's old. That's correct, yes. yeah. And I remember, you know, collecting tinfoil and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember the rationing. And then finally, just before we go, where did you grow up? What part of the country? I grew up in Sebring, Florida, which is a small town that was started by a man from Ohio. He came here probably in the early 20s. He bought a lot of land and he just said to everybody, OK, if you have a church, tell me you have a church, I'll give you a place to put it. If you have a synagogue, I'll give you a place to put it. And so I grew up in a town that was what I call a southern town. But, of course, you know, everybody comes to Florida. Mm -hmm. Nobody had to say, oh, I wasn't born here. I was born in Florida. I remember the Seminole Indians who used to stay out near Highlands Hammock. And they had a little place and they were building, making beautiful clothing. So I have that memory. It wasn't like I was in the same kind of a southern state as other people. I think I just automatically became a, an unprejudiced person. I was happy to get out of segregation and to be able to teach children of all kinds and not just people in white schools. And uh, I think about that now, and I think I was very, very lucky because I chose a profession where I could like people, they could like me, and I could do things I wanted to do to make them feel better. And I think that's the whole fun of being a teacher. You continue to be that way, even when you get older and you retire. You still like people. And you look back about people like Emily Dickens and you think, I wish I had known her. Like in the 1800s, she never got a single thing published because no woman would write a poem about, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody, nobody too? Like that, who are women. <laughs> 
No, because nobody would have printed. They say women don't write poetry like that. So she never got anything published. And her own sister I had to put all the stuff together long after she was dead. But she got discovered, and that's why she influenced me. So yes. I think about it doesn't matter how long ago somebody lived, there's a universality to yeah. what the way people are, regardless of when they live. That's a very powerful idea to close on. And we do have to say goodbye. So, Cynthia, I appreciate you taking the time out. And I've learned a fair amount. And if you would ever be interested in coming back on the show and unpacking some more of the ideas and early experiences around World War II, I'd be interested in inviting you back. Would that be something you'd fancy? That's lovely. And I really have enjoyed talking to you because you got into a lot of the ideas that I talk about. And I want to tell you that I have sent you two of my books, my last two books. Oh, so you great. have a chance to read some of these things. Excellent. I go to the post office. I think office. you'll get them. You'll probably get them. You'll get them today or tomorrow. Okay, terrific. Thank you ever so much for sending me the books. And thank you so much for taking the time to to spend this time with me. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Well, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for asking me to talk with you. And there you go, my friends. Thus concludes my conversation with Cynthia Shoemaker. Since we have some time left, I would like to pair my conversation with Cynthia with another conversation I recorded a number of years ago with Ocean Vong, who is a poet. And I love ocean sensibilities. And even though this conversation took place a while back, it's still quite relevant, especially pairing it with Cynthia. So here's the conversation I had with Ocean. You'll hear some background noise like bird songs. That's because I recorded it on Allegra Houston's front porch in Arroyo Seco. So I asked Ocean to describe the environment we're in. So here's the interview. Hope you enjoy it. There's horizons after horizons piled on top of one another. And I'm looking at these beautiful blue mountains. Uh, and it just seems like something that is so uh, conducive and forgiving to the creative mind. I think oftentimes in cities, the sounds are always uh, competing with your thoughts. A landscape like this is, in a way, a canvas in which your mind is allowed to roam and to continue to uh, explore itself and stretch out. And I didn't expect that to happen. When I came here, and it's been the past four or five days, uh, I, it, my mind has just been reeling, and I can see why Georgia O'Keeffe decided to set roots here, you know, among other great, great writers and artists. How do you draw from the circumstances around you? Pay attention to the world. I think, you know, oftentimes we have this weird the sense that uh, creative, creativity comes from this, this inspired moment. Even the word inspiration comes from the Greek root of to be braved into. Um, but, and so we, often that we're expecting this, this eureka moment, this light bulb flashing coming on. But I think it's actually a lot more mundane, um, painstaking, but also less, as, less glamorous than that. I think just paying attention to the minutia of your environment with the faith that at any given moment something can happen, even if it's just stillness, something can come out of that. In the workshop that you taught, you talked about how you have a different view of work. Work is very interesting. I think I, I come from a family of rice farmers, and I think uh, it's very important to me that w work, even creative work, remains uh, and is focused on the body, uh, work coming from the body, moving through the body. And I try to resist uh, notions of production where, you know, I, I don't want to pressure myself to produce a certain amount of pages, a certain amount of words. We often hear uh, how creative work is often qualified through quantity. And I think it's often arbitrary because no matter how many words you have, no matter how many pages you have, if you haven't done the quote-unquote work of asking those questions, uh, pushing yourself to interrogate the wonders and joys of your subjects, then the work has not actually been done. So I take myself away from actually writing or producing, and I put the work in my body. I'll take ideas and subjects. I go on walks, I, or even just, my best lines come when I'm doing dishes, believe it or not. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Talk about work, you know, uh, cleaning the house or whatnot. And just 
constantly paying attention and caring for your obsessions, nurturing them, watering them. You know, you talk about irrigation, and I think that's what it is. Creative work is irrigating your mind, irrigating your subjects and your themes with questions that propel you forward, that enrich in, uh, your project, rather than just sitting down and telling, oh, well, I better get, you know, 10 or 20 pages down today or else I'm a failure. You know, oftentimes that's how we think. And I think that's quite toxic to the creative mind. And you and I have talked a bit about our rural backgrounds. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like for you to talk just a little bit about growing up with that rural mindset and how, how does that inform the work you do now? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You know, my grandfather is an American veteran and he met my grandmother when he was serving in Vietnam. And it was very strange that uh, neither of them had been to the big city in their respective countries. My grandmother was from uh, Gao Kong in the rice paddies. My grandfather was in rural Michigan, where he would step out on his front porch and there'll be no other lights for miles. And it's just fields, fields of wheat and corn. And it, it, Saigon was the first metropolis that they've ever stepped into. And despite not knowing the language to speak to one another, my grandfather didn't know Vietnamese, my grandmother didn't know English, they understood each other through the memory of where they came from. I think they were able to joke and laugh about, you know, the ridiculousness of city life um, coming from their roots. And that was their bond. And, and ultimately, they fell in love from those uh, roots. And, and so I, to me, I always carried that mindset with me because that's the morals you know it's not just the landscape it's the morals it's the values that come out of that uh, for better or for worse um, it's just who how we are made up and you know we were talking and mm -hmm. you, you said that even to this day you know you, you feel so guilty going to a fancy restaurant when you can cook so well at home you know and I, I feel the same way even though we could afford these luxuries that are our parents couldn't have, we still hear them talking in our head, you know, oh, this, you know, for this much or $50 for this, you know, I could do this. so we can hear them. And, and I think that never really leaves us. Yeah, I remember when I was growing up, my grandmother would make German chocolate cake. Mm. And I was so excited to get the German chocolate cake and I would go out to her place and, and she would cut a tiny sliver because she was determined to make that German chocolate cake last for two weeks. Today we made breakfast. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I cooked a dozen eggs and made all kinds of quinoa and stuff. Yeah. Served it, and I felt so, so tidy. It's pride, too. It, is, it still instills in us a sense of pride. I, I love that. You know, I think, I think that a lot of Americans are that way. You know, sometimes we think that the metropolis is the only place where things are worthwhile or things are new and fresh uh, and valuable. But I think a lot of Americans perhaps come from these rural roots and they have to hide it. They have to perform the, the metropolis vernacular and, and suppress their own. And, and it's, it's very interesting to see even myself moving from one space to another and code switching, if you will. You grew up in Hartford, mm -hmm. so that was not, not country, nor is no. New York. So mm -hmm. you, would it be fair to say that the country you remember is the country of your grandmother's stories rather than your own personal experience? Absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, it was the, the morals and values of the country and even the, the accent, right? We talked about this. I the, think that's a great story. The, the accent of, uh, you know, the whole time growing up, I thought I was speaking Vietnamese, just like any other Vietnamese person. But... When I was on a panel of Vietnamese writers, Vietnamese American writers, uh, we had uh, a question proposed to us at the end, and everybody answered in their Vietnamese, and I realized how different it was from mine, and I realized that their Vietnamese was the educated Vietnamese. It's the Harvard Vietnamese, right? <laughs> and I was, and then I said, I said, oh Lord! I looked in my head and I said, well, the only Vietnamese I got is the Appalachian. <laughs> exactly like what book yeah. my <laughs> so I said, oh, Lord, here we go. They're not, you know, they're in for it here, you know. So when it came my turn, I just spoke the only Vietnamese I knew. And in English, I'm quite articulate. And so when I started speaking, I saw everyone in the audience sort of take a little jolt. <laughs> and my, and, and my, uh, the people on my panel, they turned to me a, a bit and then <laughs> imagine them thinking, who the heck let this guy? <laughs> Let this country bumpkin in, you know. <laughs> and it sounded like I was in the backwoods, you know. Uh, but that's all, the only Vietnamese I knew. 
I'm proud of that because that is my truth. And that is my first language. That is my mother tongue, even though it's it's sort of breached uh, sort of social uh, uh, moments and borders. Um, I'm okay with that. I actually think it's the outsiders, people who speaking a dialect or vernacular outside of the standard that are most innovative. Like, for example, my mother often says, and I don't even know if this is an actual Vietnamese word. You can find this in a dictionary. But oftentimes because of a limited vocabulary, my family and the people from my village would sort of have emotional uh, onomatopoeias, mm -hmm. if you will, right? So like bang is an onomatopoeia. There's emotional ones that Vietnamese do. So like if you're confused, you would say, galofo, fuckfo. <laughs> She's galofo, fuckfo, right? And that's that's one word that they would just say. So it's just, it's just all of those syllables. Yeah. Are just one word. Yeah, and Vietnamese is monosyllabic, right? But it kind of broke the rules in itself when it says make up that sound, and you can feel it. You can you can actually feel chaos and disorientation. It sounds like a butterfly careening in the fields. It's galofa, fuckfa, right? And again and again, there's all these emotional amonopias to describe things that are more accurate, mm -hmm. I think, I feel, bodily, sonically, than the definition uh, itself. And so people are always inventing uh, new ways to, to speak. I grew up, of course, in Hartford, in a, a predominantly black community when I arrived in America. And what we tell one another there, when we instead of hello or how are you, is what's good. And it's very telling. You can tell about the lives of the people when, how they s greet each other. Because it's a rough neighborhood. There's a lot of poverty. Uh, many people are down and out and don't have jobs. And it's tough. It's almost as if pain is a given. We, we know there's pain. So we want to know what's good off the bat. I think it's a very beautiful way to communicate with one another that I want to introduce myself with knowing what's your best, mm -hmm. right? What is your best? Because it's, it's been rough for everyone. And so we say, hey, what's good? Hey, what's good? You know, and then you go from there. It's always the outsiders who are innovating language and making it exciting. You have some traction in your work. We came home last night, and I read your wonderful essay in The New Yorker. So, oh, yeah. so you're, you're, finding, thing, yeah. you're finding your way into all kinds of recognition. At the top level of what poets aspire to, could you talk a little bit about how you've enjoyed being able to work at that level and be recognized at that level and, and talk about what your goals are as a poet with the kind of notice that you've been getting? I know I've read the New Yorker articles about you. I've, you've been reviewed in the New York Times. You're on NPR, all, all of the venues. Yeah. How are you working with that? What is your goal now that you have a platform that large? Um, I don't think my goals ever changed. I think I, I've, I'm surprised. I don't think any poet is foolish enough to expect to, to be in these spaces. You know, you, you, you gear yourself with rejections, and I myself get rejected all the time. I mean, that's the life of the poet. You know, what you see is just the small, brief moments, often very lucky moments. My goals have never changed. I think for me as a writer, uh, language is an act of communication. Poetry is an act of communication. Um, otherwise, I would write in my journal, and that would be okay, too. But I, did, I, I made the commitment to communicate with my fellow human beings. And the way I see it is that these venues are means of that communication. It gets more eyes on it. I can speak to more people. And beyond that, that's the, the only value that I really see. And I, I don't see any of the prestige, although I realize that's all there. I see these venues as just means of transport, um, very good means, respectable means of transport, but that's what it is to me. Um, if, if you're riding on the subway, you get on, and then you focus on where you need to go. You don't stay on the subway and check it out, or you don't <laughs> examine it. <laughs> oh, should I live here? Is this, uh, what, 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 what kind of chairs, what kind of plastic are these chairs made of, or what have you? You, know? you just get on, and when it's time to get off, you get off. And that's what I see publication is. I, I send something to somebody, I say, is this a good vehicle? Is this a good bus? Is this a good train? And if it's good enough, I'll get on, and I'll get, I'll get to where I need to go, find my people, and then continue. I, I don't want to be attached to uh, the prestige because that is abstract, and it's not a potent place to create new work. So in, in closing, I'd like to ask you to read one of your pieces. 
All right. Well, this we, we've been talking about fields and and this uh, this little piece was me imagining my parents at the moment of my conception. They spent a lot of their times in the field because it was where they had privacy at night. And I, I, I imagine many people from rural places can recognize this, that the night and the field is their room, their moment of intimate space. Like anyone else, they fled there and, and hid from adults and is where they, they were able to love each other. And of course, you know, there's a biblical uh, references to Eden as well. That's always on my mind. That's the Western influence. A little closer to the edge. Young enough to believe nothing will change them. They step hand in hand into the bomb crater. The night full of black teeth. His full Rolex weeks from shattering against her cheek, now dims like a miniature moon behind her hair. In this version, the snake is headless, stilled like a cord unraveled from the lover's ankles. He lifts her white cotton skirt, revealing another hour, his hand his hands, the syllables inside them. O oh, Father, O oh, foreshadow, press into her as the field shreds itself with cricket cries. Show me how ruin makes a home out of hip bones. O oh, Mother, O oh, Minute Hand, teach me how to hold a man the way thirst holds water. Let every river envy our mouths. Let every kiss hit the body like a season, where apples thunder the earth with red hooves. And I am your son. So there you go, my friends. That was my conversation with Ocean Fong. So I hope you enjoyed what Ocean had to say and also what Cynthia had to say. I love it when I can talk to poets and pair them together like that. It's a real pleasure to be able to to do it. And I have to say, I've been going to some poetry readings lately. I attended one last night. I'm recording this in Boulder, Colorado. I went to a reading Rosemary Wachola Traumer offered at Boulder Bookstore. And afterwards, there was an open mic. I joined in. I had three minutes to myself, along with about eight other people. And I have to say, the readings were terrific. People were really connected. They connected with the audience. And I'm glad to know that poetry readings are improving these days. I think some of the word may be getting out about how to connect with the audience, like Ocean Connects and like Cynthia Connects. And like I hope you can as well, if you ever read anywhere at any time. Finally, here I am at the end of another time together with you. So I would like to say thank you ever so much for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVM LP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online wpvmfm.org the voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico thank you Walter Parks for our theme song WalterParks.com for more on Walter's music thank you Devine Dial for managing WPVMFM in Asheville and Robin Collier for managing KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico airing up into Colorado as well around the Alamosa area. You can always reach me, Nave, at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. I would love to hear from you. And I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. Imaginativestorm.com is where you can go to find some tips on how to improve your writing and also discover a free workshop that I offer with my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston, every... Saturday noon Eastern time and also every Thursday 6 p.m. Eastern time we just gather with a group of terrific writers it's a community it's open it's free and we generate some material for an hour so if you're interested in a workshop like that 
it would be a real pleasure to see you with us sometime. ImaginativeStorm.com. And if you by chance happen to be in Taos on October the 7th, it's a Monday evening, between 6 and 8 p.m., Allegra and I are going to be hosting... We're going to be hosting an Imaginative Storm pop-up salon gathering. We'll have conversations. Allegra and I will do a little bit of a presentation, some new ideas, some interactions, some fun times. It'll be a little bit of a party. It's free. Doors open, and we would love to have you join us. That's 6 to 8 p.m. October the 7th at Mary's Place, Taos Lifestyle. It's on Paseo del Pueblo Sur. So if you're around and you're in the mood for some community and some company, we'd love to see you. And with that, I'd like to say once again, thank you ever so much for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you tune in again sometime soon. And wherever you are in the world, perhaps, just maybe, you and I will catch each other on that turnaround somewhere down the line.